Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome to the class of Public International Law again. This is lecture number 2 on Sources of International Law. I am Dr. Ashutosh Acharya, Senior Assistant Professor from Law Center 2, Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. Well friends, today proceeding from our last lecture, we will start with Sources of International Law. Now, what do we mean by sources? Sources is nothing but origin or place of origin. So, as far as international law is concerned, today we will talk about the place of origin as far as international law is concerned. What are those areas? What are those places? What are those methods through which we see the origin of international law? It is these sources which helps us to identify how international law comes into being and how international law develops. With this, when we look at the Statute of ICJ, one of the provision that is Article 38 of the Statute of International Court of Justice talks about sources of international law. It identifies four sources of international law wherein if a law is to be used by a state while contending its claim, I repeat that if a state wishes to use a law or a practice in its own favour against another state, then it must fall within any of these four sources of international law. Just like domestic legal system, if we are to contend a particular point of fact in civil matter or in criminal matter, we look at a statute, whereas where there is absence of a statute, we look for certain past practices, factual scenarios and certain other sources. But primarily the focus is on statutes as far as domestic legal system is concerned, which clears or clarifies the rights and duties of the parties based upon which the court is in a position to provide justice to the parties. To deliver justice based on law is what the function of legal system is. This is what we see in international legal system as well, wherein we see that under article 38 of the statute of ICJ, we find these four sources, these four place of origins wherein or from where we can take out the law that will be used as far as resolution of dispute is concerned, identification of rights and duties are concerned or adjudication by international court is concerned. Well, it, com it is composed of two clauses. The first clause is the important clause as far as identification of sources of international law is concerned. The first clause says that the court whose function is to decide in accordance with international law such disputes as are submitted to it shall apply. I repeat, the court whose function is to decide in accordance with international law. So, it is the duty of the court to decide a particular matter in accordance with international law. And where do you find international law for disputes between states which may be two or more than two? As are submitted to it shall apply clause sub clause A international conventions whether general or particular establishing rules expressly recognized by the contesting states. I repeat, 
international conventions. What do we mean by international conventions? It is nothing but agreement signed between two or more than two parties. It is synonymously also used with treaties. So, maybe international treaties, international conventions. However, there is a slight terminological difference that can come into being between treaties and con conventions. Conventions are largely used for an agreement, international agreement which are signed under the auspices of a United Nations organization or any other international organization, the subject matter of which is of large public importance by which I mean to say the subject matter of that particular international agreement would concern people around the globe. For example, United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea or Convention on Genocide or for that matter there are various conventions which are of public importance. Well friends, if the international agreement is not necessarily of public importance that means that it does not concern the states at large. It may concern certain states situated in a region, certain states that have economic interest of their own which may be two or three or four or more than that. But when such an international agreement is signed which is not of global importance in general, then we can say it is a treaty. Overall they may be synonymously used as well and they are used as well. Generally, when we look at any international agreement which is in force, it acts as a clear objectified source of law. So, therefore, it is a source which has come into being as a result of legal positivism in international scenario. As we see that in international scenario, laws started getting codified by which we mean to say that it is started getting written or it is started coming into a written form, then the words are clear with respect to rights and liabilities as far as states are concerned and states are then bound by those international agreements that have been signed by the states amongst each other or between each other. Now, these international conventions can be general, can be particular by which we mean to say that international agreements may be multilateral or bilateral. If it is general, it means to say that it is for everyone, the subject matter is for everyone. But if two states sign an agreement to share water or to share certain resources or there is economic interest or imposition of certain curbs as far as custom, as far as human trafficking is concerned, then special agreements or specific agreements signed between two states may be particular. Therefore, the first source would be international conventions whether general or particular establishing rules expressly recognized by the contesting states and the last important part of this line is expressly recognized by the contesting states. So, the states that are at dispute presently before international court of justice contesting states must have expressly recognized. What do we mean by express recognition? Well, friends, this express recognition is governed by certain rules which is given under Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties. This Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties tells us how a treaty can be signed, what are the methods through which it can be suspended, withdrawn or terminated, when can we say the treaty is not concluded with consent because if you remember from the last class, we had found the one of the important basis of international law being the consent. Unless and until there is consent, no international convention or treaty can be said to have been concluded. So, therefore, it must be expressly recognized and not impliedly that is the important aspect that we must note that in multiple law we may 
find that oral contracts are also sometimes binding, it can be or it may be enforced. However, in international scenario, such is not the situation. Yes, it is a contractual relationship as far as two states are concerned at certain point of time and at certain other points of time, it is binding obligation under an international agreement which may be a convention or a multilateral treaty, then in such a scenario, it is also expressly recognized. No implied recognition as far as international treaty or a convention is concerned unless and until a state has signed, acceded to it or ratified a particular convention, we cannot say that international convention has become a mandatory law or an obligation for a particular contesting state. Well, friends, the second source that we have with us is international custom as evidence of a general practice accepted as law. Now, friends, we will in detail discuss international custom in today's class. However, if you look at international conventions or international agreements or treaties, in the next lecture, we will discuss in detail international treaties. We will discuss Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties. We will discuss in detail what are the different nuances as far as law of treaties are concerned. So, therefore, for today's lecture, our focus would be on international custom as evidence of general practice accepted as law and then the general principles of law recognized by civilized nations and of course, the fourth source of international law. Now, coming back to international custom, what do we mean by international custom? So, first we need to understand what is the meaning of the word custom. There are divergent views by different authors, writers, writers and jurists as far as the understanding of the word custom is concerned. However, in domestic scenario, we say or we may argue that a usage or a practice from a longer period of time accepted by the society can be considered to be a custom. So, a practice recognized by society in a particular place, in a particular region, in a particular state can be custom. But here we are not talking about a particular state, whereas we are talking about a practice between two states or more than two states. So, if a practice is between two states, it is known as local custom, whereas if the practice is between more than two states, we can say that it is international custom. If a practice is in a particular region, we may say that it is regional custom. So, if I take the example of local custom, I would quote here the case between India and Portugal, famously known as right to free passage case. Now, here the two states that is Portugal and India are contesting states. Portugal is asking for a freeway or freedom of passage from the areas or sea areas lying near Daman and Diu and Goa area. The enclaves of Daman and Diu had been used since a longer period of time by Portuguese sailors. They also came up with certain agreements, treaties that they signed with the Marathas when Maratha rulers were in power as far as that region is concerned, that is Daman and Diu enclaves. The treaty allows them to use that passage and all of us know that Goa was to a certain point of time was ruled or was under the colony and of Portugal. Therefore, we see this dispute coming into being especially in 1947 when India received its freedom or achieved its republican state of existence, we see that the control over Goa was still in continuation by the Portuguese and therefore, they also wanted to continue their free passage through Daman and Diu enclaves. Therefore, this dispute and as a result, India also contended since it received freedom and obviously wanted to have or regain its control over Goa. In such a scenario, the dispute between India and Portugal was submitted before International Court of Justice, where 
The question before ICJ is that whether Portugal still have the right to exercise freedom of passage. We see friends here that Portuguese wanted to transport and supply arms to Goa, which was certainly not in the interest of India. The question again is that whether there is a local custom between Portuguese and in India, since Portuguese have been practicing or using the practice being the usage of that passage, the usage of that enclave for a longer period of time. So, based on this usage of passage for a longer period of time, does Portuguese have a right to free passage through that enclave? India contended that the circumstances have changed, the scenarios have changed and right to free passage may be exercised under international law, but that free passage must not be prejudicial to the interest of the coastal state. This particular claim was not a written law when this issue came before the court. However, we see that this particular claim by India became a law as far as United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea is concerned that there is right to free passage, but then it is subjected to peace and security and order of the coastal state. So, court denied existence of any local custom between Portugal or India largely due to the circumstances that have changed after the independence of India. Yes, there is a custom that exists as far as passage of ships are concerned. That is not an issue largely because it is an internationally recognized practice. Every state allows each other to freely pass through its waters till the time it is not breaching or violating peace and security or order of that particular coastal state. And therefore, to that extent, Portuguese do have a practice recognized under international custom. But as far as the ships carrying armaments are concerned, not necessarily will have the right to free passage under local custom. If a particular region is having a practice and is recognized by that particular region, that means that states of that particular region, then we can say that there is a regional custom. So, this is how we may bifurcate different international customs. And these customs come up as an evidence of general practice accepted as law. The custom is not written, it is to be proved and therefore it says as evidence of a general practice accepted as law. The third source of international law being the general principles of law recognized by civilized nations. My friends, what are general principles? We will discuss this after in detail we discuss international custom. But for an introductory aspect, I can say that these are the principles that are recognized by different states. For example, we will see and find estoppel as a principle existing in domestic legal systems of different states. Different states in their legal system recognize estoppel, that is to stop, that is if you have made a legal commitment or if you have made a commitment agreeing to a certain legal position, then you cannot take back your step, especially when the other party or the second party has acted upon or based upon or believing the first person. So, similar to this, there are various principles that exist in different domestic legal systems. And if you recognize certain principle in domestic legal system, then why not also accept it internationally? So, that is the basic idea behind general principle of international law, because there is already existence. And the advantage of general principle of law is that you need not prove the acceptance of a particular principle by a particular state because the state is already having that principle within its domestic legal system as part of its domestic legal system. So, that comes up as a clear cut certain evidence as far as utility and usage of general principle of law is concerned. 
and the last and the fourth subject of international law uh, source of international law is concerned is subject to the provisions of article 59 judicial decisions and teachings of the most highly qualified publicists of the various nations as subsidiary means for the determination of rules of law well friends apart from these three sources of international law judicial decisions by international courts by national courts tribunals can also be used as a source of law and also the teachings of most highly qualified publicists publicists jurists who have significantly contributed to the growth and development of international law their writings their teachings can be used as a source of law can be used to resolve a particular conflict between states or or understand a particular meaning of the law custom or practice now this clause 2 of article 38 of the statute of international court of justice gives us another source of international law and that is it says this provision shall not prejudice the power of the court to decide a case ex equo et bono which means that acts of good faith or decision to be made in good faith so a court can decide also based on the aspects of good faith now as i already told you that international conventions or treaties are based on consent so for international conventions and treaties the basis lies in consent pacta sunt servanda or the principle of pacta sunt servanda where it says agreements must be respected and also lies in a particular treaty or an international agreement known as vienna convention on law of treaties 1969 i would quote here article 27 of the vienna convention on law of treaties 1969 which specifically says especially for the states that can use internal law as an argument to avoid any obligation or responsibility under international law it says internal law or domestic law should not be used as a basis of avoiding any obligation of international legal system or under international law so vclt also plays a significant role as far as implementation existence of international law is concerned now friends as i told you we will discuss in detail international custom i have told you the two different types of international custom that exist as far as the bifurcation of international custom is concerned it may be local custom it may be in the form of regional custom and it may be in the form where it exists for all and when it exists for all or for region or for a loc or or between two states irrespective of that particular expansion international custom is formed or formation of international custom is taking into account the same process so what is the process or what is the method through which we see international custom comes into being the importance of international custom is that it is an evidence of general practice accepted as law and there are two basic elements that comes into being or that forms two important elements or it forms two important parts which are combined together and then after the combination of these two important facts or after the combination of two important materials comes into being international custom what are these two important parts which come together in order to form international custom or in other way we can say that two requirements are to be satisfied if a particular state has to prove that there is an international custom between two states or more than two states or in general there is an international custom or a particular state is obliged or has an obligation under international custom what are these two elements the first element is material element and the second element is psychological element material element or material facts that is the actual behavior of a states the state practice what are material facts it is the actual facts 
whatever states do or whatever however states acts or whatever acts they have done in the past as a matter of practice in a particular field can be identified so it's a fact it can be seen it can be traced and it can be quoted it can be placed through documents or through a particular incident so a factual scenario that has already happened so states when they behave in international scenario their behavioral part or their acts form a certain fact and that particular fact can be used against them in future dispute if they act contrary to the previous act so if let's say for example a particular coastal state is exercising jurisdiction for let's say about 3 nautical mile though we have a rule with respect to exercise of jurisdiction that is of 12 nautical mile with respect to territorial jurisdiction let's say just let's just assume that there is a scenario where a state is exercising jurisdiction a particular type of jurisdiction up to 3 nautical mile then if it captures a ship which is prejudicial to the interest of the coastal state within 3 nautical mile the ship that has been captured cannot say that other states are not exercising the ship cannot say that this particular state does not have jurisdiction the coastal state will have the right because of the past practices it can have that particular right because of the past practices similarly other ships will have duty within that particular jurisdiction or can be duty bound within that particular jurisdiction they might end up submitting their flag state jurisdiction to the coastal state now this was just an example an assumption an imaginary situation that i have placed before you it may be a claim in different situations we will discuss certain cases also that how international custom has been claimed whether court has recognized certain past practices to be international custom how international custom will not come into being all of this we will discuss now after we understand the second element that is the psychological element or the subjective belief that such behavior is the law now friends this particular psychological element comes into being from a phrase known as opinio juris sive necessitatis what does it mean it means or if you, if i bifurcate these four words opinio means opinion juris means law and therefore what exists in the eyes of law which is necessity that means a legal necessity it is not just or merely an opinion but apart from being a legal opinion it is a legal necessity a state thinks and believes not only thinks but believes that it is the legal necessity for the state to abide by that particular legal position so when you combine the state practice that is the actual fact and the legal belief both together then only international comes international custom comes into being the phrase was formulated by frank oise gani in an attempt to differentiate legal custom from mere social usage difference of opinions with respect to acceptance of opinio juris as to how many acts would amount to satisfaction of psychological requirement now with respect to this there is divergent opinions we leave it to subjectivity case to case basis court will decide and judge that whether opinio juris is there or not that is whether the conviction by the state is in place or not with respect to acceptance and practice as far as that legal obligation is concerned now how do you find out that there is opinio juris and there is material fact in existence so through administrative acts legislations decisions of internal courts activities at international stage you can identify the factual position at the same time through newspapers historical records comments made by government on drafts produced by ilc international law commission what a statement did you give what was your take as far as a particular convention is concerned as far as pre preparatory drafts are concerned what was your take all of those past acts your objections your acceptances your non objections everything 
cumulatively or bifurcated in a bifurcated manner will result into formation of a particular approach of a particular state approach towards a particular legal obligation now when you combine these two things certainly international custom comes into being so let us take few cases where we will see that how court has responded to the formation of international custom different interesting factual situation will tell us that how international custom is recognized by state what are the factors that court takes into account while identifying and finalizing that yes it is international custom well the first an old case of 1871 known as the scotia case it's a case between british and american with uh, british and americans the facts are that british ship had sunk american vessel on high seas why did it do so it did so because the american vessel did not show lights at night now the issue here is that whether british navigational procedures now what do we mean by british navigational procedure we will not delve into the all of these procedures but one of the important claimed procedure is that you have to show lights at night while you sail at high seas otherwise it may be considered that the ship is prejudicial to the peace and security of the first ship so or it may be a pirate ship so in order to avoid that particular threat from a ship that is not showing light it is a practice claimed by britishers or it was a practice claimed by britishers to show light at night therefore the issue whether british navigational procedures established by an act of parliament formed the basis of the relevant international custom since other states had legislated in identical terms now here friends we see that british legislation is there at the same time certain other states have also legislated learning from british legislation now if several states are copying each other or using similar practice or having a similar or same law can we say that it is international custom well americans objected to this particular aspect whereas britishers in their defense claimed that their act was justified for the reason that it is an international custom as far as displaying of light at night in high seas is concerned the court decided that american vessel was at fault for not displaying light what was the basis for this decision the basis is that court accepted british argument where it said that lighting or displaying lights at night is an international custom why because it is legal necessity for security purposes number 1 number 2 other states have also considered it to be legal necessity as far as display of light is concerned so the multiple practices quantitatively and necessity that means the quality of that legal opinion is also present so it is the quantity and the quality that largely leads to acceptance of a particular practice to be an international custom another case a celebrated case at the same time a criticized one is lotus case Fra between france and turkey it's a case of 1926 placed before permanent court of international justice the facts are that a french ship ss lotus and a turkish ship buzgot several aboard the turkish ship drowned and turkey alleged the negligence of the french officer who was arrested once the ship reached turkey the issue was here that whether turkey can have the jurisdiction to try the case now why this issue the issue here is based on the arguments placed by france that is flag state jurisdiction now friends we must note that the basic concept of law of the sea is mare liberum that is freedom of seas that is no coastal state should obstruct the sailing of a vessel belonging to any other state all these states have this well accepted right towards each other to sail through the waters of a particular coastal state but at the same time in modern legal system we have that coastal state can have jurisdiction in certain matters where the ship is not innocent where the ship 
is prejudicial to the security and order of the coastal state. However, at the same time, till the ship is outside or beyond territorial jurisdiction, the coastal state can never have jurisdiction except in extraterritorial jurisdiction matters only up to 24 nautical mile. But if a ship is let us say travelling or sailing through waters which does not come in any sort of jurisdiction of the coastal state, I repeat that assume a situation where a ship is sailing or a vessel is sailing in waters where the coastal state does not have any sort of jurisdiction or any particular kind or type of jurisdiction. Can the coastal state have jurisdiction? The answer is no. Why? Because of the acceptance of the practice and principle of flag state jurisdiction that primarily or prima facile or firstly it is the flag state that will have the jurisdiction. What do we mean by flag state? A ship carries always a flag. A ship sails or a vessel sails always under a, under the, under a particular flag. That is, wherever or whichever is state to which it belongs. So, to whichever state that particular ship belongs, that particular ship will bear the flag of that particular state. So, the ship belongs to that particular state and the ship is generally principally considered to be a floating island. That is, it is the land part of the concerned state. So, here in this case, it is the French vessel and the vessel is bearing French flag and it is in fictitious or legal under legal fiction is considered to be a floating French island and therefore, France will have the jurisdiction under the flag state jurisdiction rule. However, Turkey had taken the jurisdiction of this particular dispute and therefore, both the countries submitted this particular point of dispute that whether Turkey will have jurisdiction or France will have jurisdiction where France claims are based on flag state jurisdiction and, and the Turkish claims are based on the territorial jurisdiction that is based on subjective aspect. So, friends here the court though decided in favor of Turkey and said abstention from doing something does not show consciousness. That is if a particular state has abstained from doing something that is it has not objected to or has not accepted as well at the same time, we cannot say that it was conscious about this particular rule being getting developed and getting accepted and or it has the obligation to accept or object to that particular rule. So, here silence amounted to non-acceptance whereas, let me tell you friends here that in international law silence can lead to acceptance. You have to object to a particular practice if you fail to or when I say you I mean state if a state fails to object to a particular practice getting developed it can be or it may be used against that particular state. So, here however, we see that court said that abstention from doing something does not show consciousness that you were conscious about the development of flag state jurisdiction rule. So, therefore, flag state jurisdiction rule will be applicable only upon those states that have consciously accepted that particular rule. Otherwise, in case of Turkey which had, which had no consciousness as far as the development of is flag state jurisdiction rule is concerned, we can say that Turkey is not bound. And it said, only if such abstention were based on their being conscious of a duty to abstain, would it be possible to speak of an international custom. Now, friends, we often come across a phrase or a word in place of or synonymously used to international custom and that is customary rule of international law. Minor difference between these words are that when international custom is formulated, it certainly takes into account material facts and psychological elements or subjective elements or psychological facts that is opinio juris, opinion of the law. 
or you can say the conviction of the state towards a particular legal position. But assume a situation where there is a treaty, multilateral treaty or a convention into existence. Now we see that conventions or treaties make it a binding obligation upon state only if the concerned state has consented to it, signed it, ratified it, accepted it through all legal procedures. If the state is not party to the convention, if the state is not party to a particular universal convention also, in such situation also it will not be bound by the provisions of that treaty. It may be bound by certain past practices because of the custom being in place. But that has to be proved against that particular state whenever a dispute comes into being. Customary rule of international law comes into being in a situation where there are international conventions and those treaty provisions or those international conventions or certain provisions of international conventions are to be implemented on the states that are not party to the convention. Let me repeat friends here that when international custom is in place, international custom can be proved again a particular state. Assume a situation where there is a treaty, there is a convention in place, a particular state A and B are not party to the convention whereas state C, D, E, F are party to the convention. Dispute between A and D. D cannot invoke any provision of a convention or a treaty against A if the dispute is between D and A. However, there is one remedy that is available with D against A and that is to establish that the obligation claimed by D against A that the obligation claimed by D against A is based on international custom. That is the treaty provision is no more a treaty provision now. It has assumed acceptance. It has assumed acceptance of universal character. That means that the treaty provision is no more a treaty provision only but is now a customary practice also. That is the states not party to it are also bound by it because it has been universally accepted. That is, it is now a necessity that this particular obligation be complied with. It is now that states believe that a particular provision of a convention be used by other states also be obligated by that particular provision also. Okay. Let me give you an example of this particular position to make it more clear. And to understand this particular legal position, let us take the case of North Sea Continental Shelf cases. Now here the dispute is between, I will come back to the previous slide, the dispute is between Federal Republic of Germany versus Denmark and Netherlands. Now what is the dispute? Now if you see here friends, you will see that we have Germany sandwiched between Denmark and Netherlands. Here Netherlands has claimed a larger portion of the, if you see Netherlands here, it has tried to claim a significant amount of water. At the same time Denmark is also trying to claim a significant amount of water in the North Sea. Just because there coastline is convex in shape, they get to have a larger share as far as North Sea is concerned. Not that it has been concluded, but it has been claimed or it had been claimed by these two states as they relied on the natural prolongation principle wherein they said that any sea water in front of the coastal state will belong to them as far as claim of economic resources in North Sea is concerned. Similar goes for the Denmark. But who is at disadvantageous position here? You see Germany is here having concave shaped coastline and Germany even after being a larger territorial country is having a lesser share just because it will close down to point this. So Germany objected to this particular division of continental shelf. Now this objection by Germany 
led to North Sea continental shelf cases between Netherlands, Denmark and Germany. What is the claim by Netherlands and Denmark? They said that they wished prolongation to be effected on the basis of the equidistance principle. What is equidistance principle friends? Equidistance principle says that if there is any dispute between states with respect to delimitation, they must divide it equally. And that is what they have done, that is draw straight tangent lines here and divide it equally wherever there will be a dispute between two states with respect to delimitation of continental shelf. Now we must also note here that Germany is or was not party to the Geneva Convention on the Continental Shelf 1958 where Article 6 talks about equidistance principle. The principle of equidistance is meant to be customary international law was claimed by Denmark and Netherlands. They said that equidistance principle is not merely or only a treaty provision now or a provision of a particular convention by which only the states that have signed the convention or accepted the convention will be bound. Whereas the convention has not the whole convention but Article 6 that is of equidistance principle has reached to such an acceptable level that now it has transformed itself into customary rule of international law. So if it is customary rule of international law, then certainly Germany would be bound by it. However, Germany refused to accept it. It said, it contended that the correct rule was one according to which each of the states concerned should have a just and equitable share of the available continental shelf in proportion to the length of its sea frontage. So, it is. it should not be equidistance that you divide it equally, but the division should be proportionate in nature and it should be based on the length of the coastline and certain other relevant factors. And if you look at the legal questions raised in this case were with whether Article 6 of Geneva Convention of Continental Shelf 1958 binding for all the parties in the case, customary international law applicable equidistance principle and proportionality principle. Court in this case did not accept equidistance principle to be customary rule of international law and it gave reasons for it. Now whether proportionality principle would be applicable, certainly yes because of the variation in the structure of the coastline of Germany, Netherlands and Denmark and therefore it decided and went on to say that the parties may sign an agreement and divide it proportionately. Certainly equidistance principle has not assumed the character of customary rule of international law and it said so because parties were under no obligation to apply the equidistance principle either under the convention or as a rule of general or customary international law. Reason for saying so was that the provision concerned should at all events be of a fundamentally norm creating character such as could be regarded as forming the basis of a general rule of law. There should be widespread and representative participation that means quantitative acceptance should be there. Within the period since adoption of the convention short or long as that may be, state practice including that of states especially affected should be both extensive and virtually uniform in the sense of the provision invoked and demonstrate also that a rule of law or legal obligation is involved. Friends, again material facts and opinion jury should come together in addition to widespread acceptance of a particular convention or a provision of a particular convention. Only then we can say that a particular treaty provision has been accepted as a customary rule of international law. The court at the end advised negotiation as the best way to solve the conflict. The third source of international law friends is general principles of international law. It is a rule that will be relevant by analogy from already existing rules or directly from the general principles that guide the legal system whether they be referred to as emanating from justice, equity or consideration of public policy. These principles help fill the vacuum created due to underdevelopment of international law. Certain important cases for this particular source of international law are Temple of Previar case and Island of Palamas case. In Temple of Previar case, which is between Thailand and Cambodia in 1962, principle of acquiescence and estoppel 
was accepted as a general principle of international law to resolve the conflict between Thailand and Cambodia as Thailand was estopped or was deemed to have acquiesced to the legal position what was in continuation for a longer period of time since Thailand did not object to the temple of Previar falling within the jurisdiction or domain of Cambodia for a longer period of time it can be said and also it accepted previously the maps etc as far as settlement of boundary between Cambodia and Thailand is concerned when Siamese authorities were there. It led to the decision the temple of Vihar still falls in the jurisdiction of Cambodia based on estoppel. The second case island of Palamas between USA and Netherlands. We see brief history of the fact history of the case are that in 1677 island of Palamas was discovered then principle of acquiescence and estoppel was applied in 1898. Since we see that this principle was applied largely because of the historical practices, historical facts that here comes into being and what are those that is Spain was the state that discovered this particular island. Later on Netherlands came to that particular island. Spain did not continue to exercise its sovereignty over island. However, it continued to exercise its sovereignty the nearby territory that is the state that is Philippines and Netherlands continued to display peaceful sovereignty over the island. After USA won war against Spain in 1898, USA contended and claimed the sovereignty over island of Palamas was it went to arbitration or event for arbitration both the parties contended based on their own arguments that is where USA said that right to first discovery was that of Spain and therefore based on the argument of right to first discovery USA continues to have or will devolve or will be devolved of the right existing with respect to island of Palamas as it belonged to Spain based on right to first discovery it passes on to USA. Whereas Netherlands argument was based on continuous and peaceful display of sovereignty it had come up with certain agreements signed by the local leader the head of the tribe residing in that particular island. So for hundreds of years there was depiction of continuous display of sovereignty by Netherlands based on this court concluded or the arbitrator concluded, arbitrator Max Huber concluded that there is principle of estoppel that can be applied now. As Spain did not object to exercise of sovereignty by Netherlands over the island, it cannot now have claim. So the position is that of Netherlands which is continuous and non-disturbed. Apart from these four sources of international law that is international treaties, international customs, general principles of international law and general principles of international law apart from these three sources of international law we have four sources of international law that is judicial decisions. Though it is considered to be subsidiary mean of source of international law the decisions of the international court are not binding. However, it plays a very significant role and it has played a very significant role in the formation of law and legal system. It creates law in the process of interpreting it. So the judges do a little more than interpreting as a necessity and many a times determine. So when they interpret they end up somehow giving legal points and legal uh, determinations as far as the legal system is concerned as far as any particular point of dispute or based on fact or based on law is concerned. It may include international arbitral awards, national courts, international criminal tribunals as well. Important cases decided by international court of justice, we have reparations case. The importance of this case is that it led to identification of legal personality. It led to an answer to a very important question that is whether international organizations are legal personalities, can they be sued or can they sue? So, after devolving into the jurisprudence of legal personality, it concluded that international organizations 
can also be sued and can sue and therefore they are also legal personalities. Not a bomb case, it went into role and characteristics of nationality and it said that nationality has to be an effective one where not a bomb was a German citizen was uh, coming and going from Guatemala to Germany and then from Germany to Guatemala had huge business property and businesses in Guatemala went to sometimes Liechtenstein, took citizenship of Liechtenstein, especially at the time when Second World War started, all of his properties were seized in Guatemala. The state of Liechtenstein claimed on behalf of Nottebaum, however, was refused since Nottebaum could not be considered to be a citizen of or a national of Liechtenstein because there was no effective nationality that comes into being as far as Nottebaum was concerned. Anglo-Norwegian fisheries case, an important case with respect to criteria for recognition of baselines. There are two types of baselines, state baseline and normal baseline. What baseline to be followed? In which scenario state baseline is acceptable? Anglo-Norwegian fisheries case is important and pertinent as far as baselines are concerned. And lastly, writings of highly qualified publicists should be of a norm creating character only then we can say that a certain writing has assumed the status of a source of international law. As in the heyday of natural law, it was analysis and juristic opinions that were crucial while the role of a state practice in court decisions was of less value. Certain examples can be Gently, Grotius, Puffendorf, Pankoshock and Vettel from 16th to 18th century determined who determined the scope, form and content of international law. Apart from these four sources of international law, we have certain two other sources of international law and they are security council resolutions which are binding in nature. Certain examples as you can see is, is UNSC resolution 2720 of 2023 for humanitarian aid in Gaza Strip, UNSC resolution 1160-1199-1239-1244 for situation in Kosovo in 1998 and 1999. These are binding sources of, sources of law. Apart from the four mentioned in the Statute of International Court of Justice, Article 38. Then you have General Assembly Resolution, French General Assembly Resolutions are not binding, though they have a persuasive character of their own, such as Declaration on the Legal Principles of International Law Concerning Friendly Relations and Cooperation Among the States in Accordance with the Charter of United Nations, 1986 and Declaration on Use of Outer Space 1963. There are various declarations, there are various resolutions that have been passed by General Assembly for humanitarian or human rights matters. However, they are not binding, but they play a significant role in the form of opinion juris. If a General Assembly resolution is being passed or is tabled before a state at General Assembly meeting, the state will either vote in favor or against or abstain or give its own reasoning. Whatever stance or stand a particular state takes into account, it acts as an opinion juris for that particular state. Other states can use either in their favor or against that particular state who has taken a particular stand with respect to a particular topic, with respect to a particular area for which resolutions are being passed. So, it also carries a certain significant weightage as far as legal system, formation of legal system, progression of legal system is concerned. So, with this friends, I will end the topic sources of international law. I thank you for your patient listening. Namaskaram.